Hi, my name is David A. Wheeler, and this is an introduction to creating functions in MetaMath. Here's an outline of what I'll be talking about. Uh, we're going to be talking about creating functions in MetaMath. If you don't know what MetaMath is, go to us.metamath.org. And in particular, we're creating functions in the MetaMath Proof Explorer, also known as set.mm. We need a function to use as our example, so we're going to use SGN, also known as signum, as our trivial example. What we're going to do is modify set.mm to, first of all, create the typeset information on how to display it, you know, the HTML definition, the alternate HTML definition, and the LaTeX definition. Then we're going to create a constant called SGN, indicate that it's a class, and then actually define the function. Then we'll verify the proof and the markup. And then after that, we're going to prove that function application works as we would expect and prove at least one value of that function application. And we want to do that last point for at least two reasons. First of all, uh, in many, many cases, we're going to eventually apply the function to some base cases. It's useful to have those predefined. And also it helps to verify that the function we've defined is the function we intended to define. We need to tell MetaMath how to render the function. It might have a very interesting display. In this case, SGN will just be displayed as SGN. So in the $t, the typesetting section, we'll just say that the definition, the HTML definition is just SGN for alt HTML. The Unicode version, it's SGN. For LaTeX, it's SGN. We now need to actually define it. I should note that I'm just using an ordinary text editor. I happen to be using Vim, which has some syntax highlighting, but you can edit with any text editor. Uh, so first of all, we're going to say that there's a constant called SGN, or signum. Extend the class notation to include it and then actually define it with a preceding comment that explains a little bit more about it. You'll notice that by convention the label for defining a function is just df dash and the name of the function. It's a dollar a because we're defining something. Uh, we're saying that sgn is uh, a function where x is a member of rr star and it maps that value to this expression to the right, which simply says if x is 0 at 0, if it's less than 0, it's minus 1, otherwise it's 1. You'll notice that x has to be a member of rr star, that's a decision I made. rr star is the reals, also including plus and minus infinity. Uh, I've decided that sgn would be useful to apply to plus and minus infinity. Now that we've entered that, Let's verify the proof and the markup. And it doesn't take long, so let's verify everything. So here's a little command to read in the set mm, verify everything, both the proof and the markup. Just going to read in every proof, check them. They're all fine. Check the markup. And that prevents a whole lot of problems. And that's a good thing. Now, we've defined the mapping function for SGN, but usually we use functions like this through function application. In set.mm, that's the back quote operation, uh, which is an infix operation. And so we need to prove that the application of the function means what we would think it would mean in cases where uh, we have the right domain. So I've opened up MMJ2 to prove this, and I'm uh, using automation here. Now if you look at uh, other, other uh, proofs of this kind of thing, of functions given a mapping, you'll find that FEMPT and related uh, theorems are very, very useful for this sort of thing. So I'm going to just start with that. And you'll notice it managed to automate a whole lot of things here. Uh, we need to prove that the result is in underscore v, we need to know what the function is, and we need to prove that we can map a set variable to class variable. One of the things we need to know is what is the function? Well, that's easy enough. We are, in fact, already just defined that. All right, so sgn equals something in rr. Well, we need a set variable here. I'm going to arbitrarily pick x. 
why not? Now we managed to prove a whole bunch of things automatically. We managed to convert automatically the set variable to a class variable. The two spots we have left to do is we need to prove that 0 and 1 are in V. Those facts aren't in the database. But I already know that uh, 0 is certainly a member of the complex numbers. So let's see if it has that in the database. Control U. Oh, yep. And once it found that, it could prove this. We'll do the same thing here. 1 is a member of the complex numbers. All right, and we now have a proof. It's important to define some specific values that are pre-calculated. For one thing, a lot of proofs often end up using some specific values, and I also find them useful to gain confidence that the def definition you gave is the one you intended. So let's define what signum of zero is. Hopefully, we should be able to prove that the signum of zero is zero. Well, one thing we know we're going to need is the definition of signum when it's applied as a function. So that, that by convention, that's always the name of the function with val. Let's do control U. And oh, look, it's loaded up the definition for us. Well, in this case, we don't want an arbitrary definition. We want to know the definition when we apply it to zero. So let's apply that, control U again, and it says, hey, if zero is a member of RR stars, then sigma of zero is equal to that, and then we're going to need to prove that that whole thing eventually simplifies down to zero. Uh, we don't, before we even go very farther, let's admit, though, that we should be able to prove that zero is a member of the RR stars. What do you think? Let's see here. Yep, that's already a known fact in the database. So let's simplify this down. 120, if we depend on that and that, we should be able to prove in the turnstile that, okay, that basically we're able, to, those two are equal, control U. Uh-oh, we have an error. Oh my goodness, can't have one of those. Um, There we go. Alrighty, so <clears throat> by modus ponens, we have simplified it down already. Now we just know that if we can prove that signum is that, and if, if we can prove that this is, we already can prove that this is equal to that, if we can prove that that equals zero, we'll be okay. Well, how can we do, well, wait a minute, if zero equals zero, then it's, zero. well, now let's see, I'll bet we can prove that zero is zero. What do you think? Okay. In fact, this is going to be just, you know, things are always equal to themselves, so that is hardly a challenging thing to prove. Now, if we take those two things, we should be able to uh, ask questions about, uh, in fact, let's see here, well, let's pull this out. All right, we should be able to prove that if 0 equals 0, right? okay, that implies that this is an overly complicated way to do things. Really, what I, I know I need to do mentally is there's already something in the database that lets me tell you if something is true, then we can only then we can pull out the first part. So here's my if expression here. Okay. We can just substitute that in right here. Now control U. See if, if 0 equals 0 then that whole expression simplifies down to 0. Excellent. Um, well since we know that 0 equals 0 and the 0 0 implies that we should be able to do this, 320, based on 200 and 300. We should be able to determine that this whole thing is the same thing as 0. 
Oh, we forgot our turnstile. There we go. Another modus ponens here. So, let's see. We have managed to prove that this lengthy if expression is equal to zero. Oh, but wait. That if expression up there is, we proved earlier, is the same thing as signum. So, if we combine 120 with 320 and do control U, we have now proven it.